So uh, it's been a couple of weeks uh, since we've la uh, last met for Jews and the News, and I hope everybody uh, had a good uh, winter break, a happy Hanukkah, and a happy New Year. And I hope uh, this new secular year, 2023, will be better than 2022 for all of us, a year of blessings and health. And um, I wanted to talk about uh, Judaism and democracy um, and um, just uh, share some historical context and um, how this applies both to uh, the Jewish community in America and also uh, the Jewish community in Israel and or the state of Israel as such uh, being a, uh, a democratic state. And what, what does democracy have to do with Jewish tradition? So um, in the Torah, where all things Jewish uh, stem from, no matter what denomination we are um, in, in Judaism, uh, no matter how we define ourselves as Jews, uh, everything stems from the Torah. And um, so uh, the Torah actually, when describing or teaching us what kind of society to set up in the land of Israel, um, this is from the time of Moses at Mount Sinai uh, in the middle of the book of, of Exodus through uh, the rest of the Torah. We only, we, we are, we're told how we are supposed to relate with one another how we are supposed to take care of the land, and how we are supposed to support the religious institution uh, within the Jewish community. But we're not told what kind of government to have. So there's, there's lots about whether you can have a, a slave or not. There's lots about how to conduct uh, business affairs. There's lots about how to farm and leave the corners of the field to the poor. Um, there's lots about uh, collecting a half shekel tax every year from any, <clears throat> everybody 20, age 20 and up has to give a half shekel tax, but that's not for infrastructure. Uh, it's for supporting the, the, um, the Mishkan, the portable sanctuary, and later to support the temple in Jerusalem. So, uh, so you have taxes being collected, but it's for it's for the temple. And there's a lot about how uh, the Kohanim and Leviim, uh, the priests and Levites, are supposed to work. How they are supported with uh, a, another tax, <clears throat> the seven-year agricultural cycle. Uh, se several times during the, that seven-year cycle, uh, a tenth of the produce is supposed to be set aside for the Levite and the poor and the orphan, um, the widows and the orphan. So um, poor people uh, and disadvantaged are supported through, uh, through the agricultural tax that is part of a religious system of understanding how to farm the land. Um, and um, so you have um, basic uh, care for uh, people at, built into this religious system. We also have a description of judges, uh, that the uh, judges should be appointed to handle cases that come before them. Um, both uh, Jethro, Moses's father-in-law, suggesting to Moses that while they're wandering in the desert, there should be magistrates set up so that Moses doesn't have to, to have to hear everybody's complaint. There could be magistrates for tens, for hundreds and thousands, so that there could be a system like that to hear people's uh, ca the cases that come before them. So you have that in Exodus set up. We're told in general that judges are supposed to be uh, blind to status, to wealth. Um, and uh, we're told that uh, the judges sit at the gate along with the elders um, at the gate of the towns uh, to uh, listen to such cases. So 
without one particular section of a chapter in Deuteronomy, everything that I have just said is is um, is is how society is presented um, that it should be how it should be run. Pretty simple, pretty um, individualistic, but within the greater um, confines of the community that we're all in this together. We have following the religious laws of supporting the temple in Jerusalem, supporting the poor through the agricultural um, uh, uh, precepts uh, and um, simply uh, bringing cases to the judges at the city, at the city gates. So, uh, so far, there's nothing about a system of government that is supposed to be in place once the people enter the land of Israel. That only comes uh, with a few verses that are presented in the book of Deuteronomy in case the people want to have a king. So th there are five or six verses in, in the, the portion Shoftim, which uh, reflect this idea. If you want to have a king, this is how uh, the king is supposed to um, conduct himself uh, over the over the country. So um, there's law. The the king is not just supposed to have excessive wealth. The king is not supposed to go to Egypt to look for uh, horses or uh, things like that. Not but the king is supposed to um, king is supposed to keep the Torah with him and to um, can you make it louder? read the Torah. Uh, I'm just muting uh, everybody uh, and keep the Torah at his side uh, all the time. Okay, so uh, that those verses about the about the king again, not a democracy. It's a, it's a, it's a monarchy that is described in those few verses in the book of Deuteronomy. But then most of the rest of the, book, of the books of the Bible reflect the monarchy that is in place in Israel, okay? So a question for another time is when was the book of Deuteronomy written? Was the Deuteronomy written in response to the monarchy or is the book of Deuteronomy foreshadowing what will come to, into place uh, once the people settle in the land of Israel. That's, that's a question that's still debated today by biblical scholars. But after, after the Torah, you have Joshua taking over the leadership from Moses, leading the people in battle as they settle the land of Israel. The book of Judges continues that, and the book of Judges describes how there are these individuals from different tribes over the course of a couple hundred years that the book of Judges describes, um, leading the people in battle mostly, and perhaps being a leader of the people. Uh, but it's certainly not in the form of a king or, uh, or something like that, and certainly not in the form of any kind of dynasty like a king uh, from each, each judge lived independently, of other judges and uh, arose to respond to a particular crisis that was happening within the community of Israel at the time. So Samson, as an example, Jephthah, Gideon, uh, Deborah, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These are among the several judges described in the book of Judges. It's not until the last judge, Samuel, that we have the transition to kings. Saul first, then David, and then the Davidic dynasty. So uh, it, in the Torah, we have a description of how society is, is an agri agricultural-based society with uh, just uh, this hodgepodge system of judges uh, sitting at the village gate to handle uh, legal cases or other kind of problems that might arise. Uh, no such, no sense of, of infrastructure, anything like that to take care of building roads or anything like that, but rather 
people, villages are on their own, and the agricultural laws will take care of ensuring that the poor and the disadvantaged are taken care of in the community. Later, Bible uh, describes monarchy and uh, most of the kings of Israel being corrupt with power uh, and uh, corrupt with uh, 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 trying to collect as much wealth as possible on the backs of the people by uh, imposing heavy taxes, by forcing con conscription into the army to wage battles against neighboring uh, uh, empires or city-states. So um, there's no such thing as democracy as, as we know it, as a modern political idea. There's no such thing as democracy based in the Torah or in the Bible, which, and, and just to highlight this further, certainly uh, from the time of, um, of uh, uh, Hanukkah with the, um, with the uh, Greek emperor, uh, the Syrian Greek emperor uh, Antiochus and uh, the laws that he imposed on the Jewish population of, um, of the land of Israel at that time, 2,100 years ago, um, Jew Jews have always uh, been the minority uh, again in um, countries or empires that are run by kings, queens, or emperors. So there is no democracy that we know of that arises until modern times, right? So, so Jews, the, the, the model of government that Jews know is uh, an emperor, king, or queen. So that, um, and Jews live, have lived throughout the centuries at the whim of the king's queens and emperors. So you have Roman emperors who either ignore the Jews, that would be the best for, for the Jewish condition, or who have imposed uh, war against the, the revolting Jews in the land of Israel and then enslave them. Just go to Rome and uh, go to the Arch of Titus to see how uh, the, 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 the the, the depiction of the looting of the temple in Jerusalem, carrying the menorah on the shoulders of the Roman soldiers, taking it out, is depicted there in the Arch of Titus. That, that just one example of Roman emperors um, um, uh, defeating the Jews and, and treating the Jews. You have uh, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella in Spain uh, forcing the Jews either to convert to Christianity or to be expelled from the Iberian Peninsula. You have the church sometimes running uh, affairs of state in where Jews are living. Like um, the, the Machzor uh, has um, that Unatana Tokef prayer that's in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur Musaf. That's a response of um, a rabbi who was supposed to, uh, was called to the bishop of the town in Germany to, um, to, uh, to take care of uh, the Jews in that town and uh, was, was asked to convert or uh, uh, some such thing to, uh, to bring the Jews under the, under the, uh, uh, under the rule of the bishop of that town. And there are many such cases in which the, the bishop or the, the church leader in general, whether it was a bishop, a cardinal, monsignor, or whatever it is, forcing the Jews to pay an extra tax for, for protection. Uh, it's not until Napoleon arises uh, in uh, the late 1700s, early 1800s, that we begin to understand in modern times a different form of government um, being possible, right? So it's not until the 1800s, really, that, uh, that there is an option available uh, other than a monarchy 
for how people live their lives and uh, or how they're ruled and governed. Uh, people are just used to the idea that there's a king or a queen or an emperor ruling their lives who's going to impose taxes and and will therefore supposedly protect the people and make sure that everybody is safe and able to go about their business, whatever their business is. So it's it's not until Napoleon and, and the French Revolution that, uh, that uh, another possibility exists, that power exists within the people. And it's uh, though 17, um, 1789 was the French Revolution, it wasn't until 10 or so years later that the Jews were in, included in that. Uh, Napoleon had to um, appoint uh, a separate council to try to decide what to do with the Jews now in uh, under his rule uh, in France. Everybody else, um, uh, liberté, uh, egalit egalit whatever, liberty, egalitarianism, fraternity, don't remember the French words right now, and uh, but uh, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, it only it applied to all French citizens except the Jews until ten or so years later, when finally the Jews supposedly were included in that. Um, that's a discussion for another time. Also about the remnants of anti-Semitism. We've talked about that before, but in terms of democracy, the sense that people have power. It wasn't until Napoleon that that idea really, really um, bore fruit. And um, so when Theodor Herzl, 100 years after Napoleon, um, raises the idea in 1897 of a Zionist Congress, the idea of the Zionist Congress was based on Western um, ideas of, of a nation state that were um, common at the time. So the idea for is the state of Israel to come into being was based on other ideas at the time of what nationalism means. So it's it, the idea that Israel should always be a democratic state is really the idea of imposing Western values on what would be a homeland for the Jewish people, which meant that there was debate within the Zionist Congress among Jews who were living in Western, uh, Western countries in Europe uh, that are used to getting used to the idea of some semblance of democracy or power of the people and other Jews who are not, who are still living under the czar in Russia, right? So the Jews of Russia at the time of Theodor Herzl, 1897, are still living under the czar, and they had not experienced, Jews of Russia, have not experienced the idea of democracy yet, because there have been czars in Russia just for the hundreds of years before that. So so the Jewish community that was being brought together by Theodor Herzl was a Jewish community that was divided. There some, like I said, are used to getting used to the idea of democracy. Some had never heard of it before and would argue for a Jewish state of the, of the state of Israel whereas others would be arguing for a democratic Jewish state in Israel. Okay, so, and that this is an argument then, or a debate that still is there within the state of Israel today, as is evidenced by the nature of this coalition government that, Net, that Benjamin Netanyahu has put together. That there are these so-called modern Jews who 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 know about what democracy is, but maintain the idea of what Jewish tradition says about how society should run, right? So, like I said, Torah, 
does not say anything except for a few verses about a king. The Torah doesn't know anything about government style, and the government style it knows is monarchy. So ultra-religious Jews look forward to the day when the Messiah will come, that will then, the Messiah, the anointed one, that's what Messiah means. It's the uh, English version of the word Mashiach, which means anointed one, the, uh, who is a king, uh, descended from King David. So when the Messiah comes, we'll revert to a monarchy again in the land of Israel. The temple will be rebuilt, and that's the model that ultra-Orthodox Jews look forward to and pray for three times a day. You can argue that we pray for that three times a day as well, but our conservative movement prayer book has taken out the future tense for looking forward to sacrifices being offered in that temple. We do look forward to God's presence being uh, restored in Jerusalem. We say that three times a day in, in our prayers, but the, any reference to sacrifice is either omitted or put in the past tense. So um, most Jews are looking forward to the, the, the restoration of the Messiah or the coming of the Messiah and the restoration of the entire Jewish community in the land of Israel, but not as a democracy. Okay, so there's also, and so you have the ultra-Orthodox then, what they, they want a theocracy, right? God being behind everything with the, with the Messiah. And you have ultra, you have a right, right wing politically oriented people in Israel, in government who are looking for a, a Jewish law to be the law of the, of the state of Israel would be quite happy with the chief rabbinate uh, deciding what the laws should be. That, uh, you know, just arguing that construction projects for the, uh, just if you just look at the Times of Israel as a website, and I, I choose the Times of Israel because it's centrist. If you want liberal, go to Haaretz. If you want more right-wing, go to J Jerusalem Post or even others that are more right-wing than that. Uh, I like Times of Israel to be kind of balanced uh, there. Anyway, every day there's something that's coming from the from the government that is um, I see as a threat to democracy, and um, the, the idea that the state of Israel should be a state for all Jews, not an orthodox or right wing orthodox state. So there are there's the the Haredim, the uh, right wing, the, the uh, ultra orthodox in Israel, don't want transportation projects, construction projects, to happen on Shabbat, right? And so, but the the uh, it can, the transportation ministry, uh, it's it's is it the transportation ministry versus the economics ministries? One, the, these two ministries are opposing each other. The other one is saying. No, we need these transportation projects to continue on Shabbat, meaning uh, the ultra-Orthodox don't want Jews working on Shabbat. That's a violation of Shabbat. Um, and so the state of Israel shouldn't be promoting construction projects happening on Shabbat. That they're, and, and others are saying, no, this needs to happen. We're a, we're a state. These projects are vital to the uh, to the well-being of, of, the, of the state, and we need to have these projects happen. So um, there, there's, there's just one example of the, uh, the right-wingers, whether they are uh, wearing a kippah like I do, uh, or uh, wearing the black coat, black hat, a part of the government of Israel, arguing for Jewish law to be the law of Israel, and others who are still hoping that the state of Israel maintains its democratic sense from which it was born, right? So again, I'm just, I just want to reiterate this idea. What the, the Declaration of Independence of Israel, adopted on May 15th, 1948, contains in it Western ideas that uh, the average Jew brought up in the yeshiva 
would not be familiar with. If you had no Western education as a Jew, you would not be familiar with the concepts that the Declaration of Independence of Israel states in it. But if you are raised as a Jew in Western-oriented institutions, whether you went to public school, you went to college, university, gymnasium, you're learning Western values and then adopting them within, to, within Jewish life. Okay, so, so I guess my point in all of this is saying uh, it's, it's, the, it's the nature of Jews in the world today to be confronted with ideas that are not Jewish and then deciding whether to adopt them into Jewish life or not. So when Jews were allowed to be citizens of France, it began a wave across Europe of Jews being granted citizenship. And once they were granted citizenship, and allowed then to leave the ghetto, you have this age of Jewish enlightenment that happened. In other words, enlightenment being open, our minds open to new ideas that we hadn't been taught in the traditional yeshiva world that we grew up in as Jews in the ghetto. So enlightened to literature, to philosophy, to science. So you have Jews who are adopting enlightenment ideas versus Jews who want to maintain the yeshiva world. Um, and then there are Jews who want to still be, or I mean, that's, that's the whole reason why different denominations of Judaism started, right? So conservative Judaism, reform Judaism, Orthodox Judaism, all started as a result of the um, the Enlightenment and and before that the uh, Napoleon granting citizen citizenship to Jews in France, so uh, um, it's all about uh, living a Jewish life in light of how to adopt outside values and culture into our Jewish life and how to adopt political ideas outside, political ideas into our own Jewish life. So that, you know, synagogue structure, uh, once, um, once this idea of democracy takes hold, then most synagogues in America are run in a democratic function, to, uh, in a democratic way as well. So uh, the political idea of democracy um, has, we think, and we, we take for granted that it's part and parcel of what uh, being, uh, what leading a Jewish life means, that, that, that Jews should always be in support of democratic ideals. But what I'm saying, what I've been trying to point out in, the, in this past half hour, is that it hasn't always been there. It's relatively new in our 4,000 year history, and it's coming to a head in the state of Israel today. For those Jews in Israel who take democracy for granted and other Jews in Israel who say we've been tainted by democracy, who are we as Jews in Israel to want to bend to the will of Western society? Look what it's done for us. Um, and we, we need to be more right uh, uh, politically in our approach uh, to how to conduct our lives and affairs in Israel. Um, is that true outside of the US in terms of synagogue structure? Um, I, synagogues in Israel, um, synagogues in Israel, Orthodox synagogues in Israel are funded by the state of Israel. Uh, so synagogues are built with tax, with uh, Israeli tax money. Uh, to, uh, and rabbis are appointed to Orthodox synagogues by the chief rabbinate. So sometimes if a synagogue is small in a neighborhood, perhaps there's a neighborhood, a bigger city rabbi who might take turns 
uh, one Shabbat going to one synagogue, another Shabbat going to another synagogue. And then it's up to the community not really to run its own affairs. There's no membership dues or anything like that. It's just a matter of you know deciding who's going to have an aliyah on Shabbat and who's going to read Torah and who's going to daven. So Orthodox synagogues in Israel run with that kind of structure. They don't have to worry about uh, paying the heating bills because, or the air conditioning bills, because they get money from the state of Israel to maintain the building. Um, in Europe, uh, synagogues in Europe uh, are, uh, it depends on the country in Europe. Uh, there's the, um, there's uh, in, in England, for example, Orthodox synagogues are the official synagogues and the Jewish community of, of, uh, of, of uh, Great Britain supports all their synagogues. I don't think there are dues in, for synagogues, there are dues to be a Jew. So uh, from what I understand, you have to, if you want to be buried in a Jewish cemetery in England, you have to pay the dues to the Jewish community, not necessarily to a synagogue, but to the Jewish community. And if you do, then you have the right to be buried in a Jewish cemetery. So that gets people to belong to synagogue. And in, uh, in France, I think it's the there there is a Jewish community structure that supports the rabbis and the synagogues and the schools. So every country in Europe is a little bit different in how it supports its Orthodox synagogues and its non-Orthodox synagogues. So um yeah. So, um, so democracy then. So um, you know, it's, it's interesting, there's a debate in Israel today about Zionism. Uh, it's, it's always a debate about Zionism in, in, in Israel, right? That, it, that government buildings have Theodor Herzl's picture officially on the wall, along with the picture of the current prime minister. So in the Knesset, you have Theodore Herzl. In, the, uh, in all government agency buildings throughout uh, in Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, wherever they are, you have Theodore Herzl and the mayor of the town or the current prime minister, whatever. So Theodore Herzl is the father of the modern state of Israel. And so his idea of what Zionism is, is part and parcel of what Israel is. So nobody in Israel has suggested yet to throw out Theodor Herzl's picture. So until they do, Zionism still, as defined by Theodor Herzl, still has to be part and parcel of what, it, what the Israeli government is all about and what Israel as an entity is all about. So if Israel maintains a connection to Theodor Herzl, it has to maintain a connection to his ideals of what Zionism is, and Zionism is demo it maintains democratic ideas behind it. That uh, Herzl's vision of Israel being a homeland for all Jews, not just Orthodox Jews, is still has to be reckoned with. So that as a non-Orthodox Jew, I've always felt um, different in Israel. It's it's kind of it's so. Non-Orthodox synagogues have to raise their own money to build a synagogue. They have, to, they have to raise money to buy land. They have to get permission from whatever uh, municipal council to buy uh, a plot of land. Then they have to raise the money to build the building. And then they have to raise the money to maintain the building and to hire a rabbi. So most Israelis aren't used to that idea and they don't have that much discretionary income because the tax rate in Israel is so high, you don't have that much money left over in the bank um, to support other, uh, other things like that. So uh, if you have a synagogue in your neighborhood that you can go to versus a synagogue that you're going to pay for, that's why it's very hard for non-Orthodox synagogues to really have a foothold in Israel. And uh, for them, I, I, so uh, my father and I have, have lived through this um, throughout our lives as conservative rabbis, and it's, it's really been uh, a, a, a ter a, an awful struggle 
that has really been waged by American rabbis who have made Aliyah and American Jews who have made Aliyah to try to um, build up the Masorti conservative movement in Israel um, to um, um, very, very limited success. Very, very limited success. And same with the reform movement in Israel as well. So the problem is the reform and conservative are seen as a as an American uh, influx as opposed to a natural Jewish idea. So it's one thing, and and the, the other complicated factor in this is that Jews who made Aliyah to Israel from Arab countries also have not have no idea what democracy is about. Even though they've made Aliyah in modern times, Arab countries in modern times were not democratic, right? They were dictatorships. Jews coming from Morocco are used to a king. Jews coming from Egypt are used to a dictator. Jews coming from Libya or Tunisia or Iraq were all used to dictators being there. All right, so, so that's another problem. The sizable Mizrahi, that is um, the Sephardi, that's how the Sephardi community is really referred to, a Dota Mizrach, the uh, Eastern communities, really Arab country communities, are also not used to democracy. So, so you have uh yes there is state support for churches and in, in i'm almost sure there's state support for churches you know the bob that's a good question that's a good question about churches and mosques uh where do they get their money i think you know so so churches have their own you know there's the it's like how the catholic church works in the world you got the big pot of gold uh in the vatican um, and that's distributed throughout the Catholic churches throughout the world. I think the same is true for the Orthodox churches, that you have this pot of gold that's distributed that way. So I think that's how the Greek Orthodox and, and the Roman Catholic churches work in Israel. They're funded by the bigger Orthodox Roman Catholic church authority. Now, the mosques there's, there's the Muslim religious authority known as the Waqf, W-A-Q-F. I don't know how they get their money. I really don't. I think, I think, I, well, the, the authority that controls the Al-Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount is supported by Jordan. So the King of Jordan gives money to support the religious authority, at least on the Temple Mount. But I don't know about other mosques throughout Israel. I really don't know about that. Uh, so it's an interesting question. Um, so, um, so I do know that the that the gold dome of the uh, Dome of the Rock that's not the Al Aqsa Mosque. The Al Aqsa Mosque is the is the gray domed mosque on the other end of the Temple Mount. The golden dome is what we picture in our mind's eye when we see the old city in Jerusalem. That Dome of the Rock is just a shrine for the rock on which in the Muslim world, Abraham brought Ishmael for sacrifice, but it's the same rock that Abraham brought Isaac for sacrifice, because that's Mount Moriah is where the Temple Mount is. That's Mount, Mount Moriah. Anyway, uh, that golden dome was um, was redone by um, King Hussein, I think, uh, shortly before he died, so uh, a number of years ago. So, uh, yes, yeah, so Jordan runs the Muslim Authority at least in um, uh, in in the old city of Jerusalem. So, back to this idea of democracy. Democracy is a Western idea. That's part of Theodore Herzl, which is part of Israel's history, but it's just part of Israel's history. It's, it's Ashkenazi, European, Western Jews who made Aliyah from, eight, from really from the 1880s. Uh, but uh, after Theodore Herzl, 1897, built all the kibbutzim, those are all European Western Jews coming 
to establish the yeshuv, the settlement, uh, the pre a pre-state of Israel Jewish community. So Western ideas, these are people that were, and then there were, there were religious people who did make Aliyah at the time, but they were in the minority compared to the rest of the, um, the rest of the Jews who are building the kibbutzim, uh, who are secular Jews, Westernized Jews. Um, as, and so the leadership of Israel in 1948, or all these David, David Ben-Gurion, Shimon Perez, all of these people who are made Aliyah from Europe, or might have been one or two who are born in Israel uh, and became part of the leadership, Golda Meir, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All these people trained in Western ideas and Western schooling, bringing that and making it an Israeli version of it. And then what to do with these Arab, the Jews making Aliyah after the state of Israel is established from Arab countries, how to, uh, who are not used to democracy and how to uh, train them on, in democracy. What about the Ethiopian Jews who are making al Aliyah as well, have no idea about democracy either. Uh, uh, Russian Jews making Aliyah who have no idea about democracy either. So you see the problem then with democracy in Israel today and for those of us who think that Israel should be open to all Jews, should be a democratic state, should treat all its citizens, whether they're Jewish, Arab, uh, or not, or Druze, whatever, all equally, and what threat that might have to the Jewishness that we all think Israel should be uh, a Jewish, a Jewish homeland. So I, I raise all of this just as what what the, uh, the uh, multi-layered, uh, multi-nuanced uh, idea of what uh, Judaism and democracy is all about. So, any any questions or or comments uh, about this? Yeah, Bob. Um, do you think the right wing movement in Israel is being driven by? the large influx of Jews from Arab lands. So no, the leadership, so the only one is um, Derry. Uh, and he's it's still, he's a minister in, in the government right now. And he's he's the, the leader of the, the largest Sephardic or uh, Arab country uh, based uh, Jewish political party, um, which used to the, the um, the, the religious leader of that was the, the chief, former chief rabbi of Israel, Ovadia Yosef. Um, so Derry was a disciple of his. And um, so uh, he's the only, I think he's the only Sephardi uh, or Jew of Arab descent that's in the government right now. In fact, there was one, Amselem, also on Times of Israel a couple of days ago, uh, who was uh, left out of any kind of position from Likud in any kind of uh, important position. And he's, he's uh, from uh, Arab descent. So um, that, that's, a, that, it was a, it was, it, it was part of Menachem Begin's revolution in the late seventies to uh, have David Levy, a Moroccan Jew, part of his government, the first time that that happened. And then it took, a while for Yitzhak Navon uh, to be president of Israel, a, uh, a an Arab Jewish uh, president of Israel. So it's taken a long time for uh, these Jew, Jews of Arab descent to to, uh, to have a leadership position in Israel today. But um, yeah, so uh, they don't. So, so uh, that's not an issue. the The issue is these other. Uh, um, um, Smotrich and Ben Gavir, um, and, and their a tremendous influence um, on uh, on the government today, and how uh, you know Netanyahu Net Netanyahu lives and dies by Smotrich and Ben Gavir, um, as as Ben Gavir showed by going to the Temple Mount, even though Netanyahu supposedly told him not to do that. So. Um, you know, so so the, all these right wing elements, and I, I'm not sure Ben Gavir's and Smotrich's um, education background. So they go to university, or were they just uh, yes, uh, re so? So here's the other thing: 
public school in Israel, you have a choice. You can go to secular public school like I did when I was in fifth grade, or you can go to religious public school. So religious public school means being taught Judaism in public school based on an orthodox version of Judaism. So it's, it's unclear how much Western ideas enter into the curriculum of the religious public schools in Israel versus the secular public schools in Israel. So that the, the fact that there are two different parallel um, education systems in Israel also sets the, the, the community of Israel, the population of Israel uh, at odds with one another. Um, I'm not sure what the percentage is of, um, of uh, the population that goes to the secular uh, public school versus the religious public school. I, I would imagine most go to the secular, but I don't know what the proportion is. Is it 60-40, 70-30? I'm not sure, but it's enough to, to create a divide in Israeli society. What has, what has enabled the society to come together is the army. The army brings all, everybody is required to go to the army at age 18 from whatever background, religious, uh, modern Orthodox religious to secular. You go to the army and you, you meet each other where you haven't met each other necessarily before. You work together, you fight together, and that brings society together. And that's that's the big question. What about the ultra-Orthodox who don't serve? So they, they're on the outside, and they still get funded by the Israeli government, nonetheless. So you see what uh, how fractured Israeli society is and how tenuous it is. So whenever um, a fringe has control of the government, that's, that, that, that threatens the fabric of the entire uh, Israeli society. It, it, uh, uh, government works better if it's centrist, then everybody's uncomfortable with it, but they're equally uncomfortable. But if it's a fringe, right, it's not fair that one fringe is comfortable with the government and the rest of it isn't. So we'll see how long the Netanyahu government will last and what kind of impact it's going to have. The main thing right now is it's on judicial reform. So, you know, there are protests that are starting up in Israel today about that. So um, we'll see about this, but the but um, democracy, as we see, is not part and parcel of Jewish life. It's only part and parcel of Jewish life in Western in countries in 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 education systems in the Jewish community that have been influenced by Western thought, and that's not everywhere. Clearly, it's not everywhere around the world. Any other questions or comments about this? Okay, so thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's good to see everybody. And uh, next week is Martin Luther King Day. Uh, we'll have class next week. We'll talk about uh, next week, uh, Jewish black community relations. Have a good week, everybody. Thank you. Have a good day.